87 all over the roadway. Comes back to an 87 Pontiac out of Clinton Township. And then one does like this. Is there a problem, officer? Sir, do you know how fast you were going back there? Well, hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us again tonight. I thought we'd start with something a little more fun. Uh, I played that the, the uh, safety stand down at Syracuse yesterday. We had two safe people and about 100 people in a uh, ice storm. Week. Um, last week, we talked about the um, CFI and the, the secret sauce of the CFI is empathy, compassion, communication. And this time we're going to talk more about the environment and the learning zone, as I call it. And what that is, is the optimal learning situation for aviation. Um, aircraft itself is probably the worst place to teach. You've got all the distractions there. The ideal setting, obviously, for learning is on the ground. But the relationship is the key part of that. There really has to be a relationship of trust. There has to be the idea that their mistakes are going to be made. I mean, if you think about somebody starting in any environment, they don't know anything. So initially clueless, making mistakes is sort of by definition what a learner is going to be doing. They also additionally have what we call naive rendition, which is an adult learner is going to have some idea of how they think that plane flies. They're going to have negative transfer from driving. And all of these things, a CFI who's savvy has to understand. So the CFI brings the compassion and the empathy, and the learner brings motivation and curiosity. Our job as educators is not to put out that fire, that motivation. And then the the part on the of the um, the learner that's kind of it's omnipresent, but it's very counterproductive is the ego. I used to always say to my CFIs when I was training them that when you're teaching, you actually have three people in the aircraft. You have the educator, the learner, and then you have that sort of ego in the middle. So if you can get rid of that and you can get rid of the excuses, you really then have the learning environment. And that's why this says stop making excuses. It's probably the hardest thing. But as I wrote in the blog, if you read it, was I remember when I was a really young learner and, <laughs> of course, having problems, even though it was a Piper, the Autoland PA-28, I said at one point, boy, I'm really screwing this up. I'll get better at this. It's my fault. And that's when my instructor, uh, Jerry Bovelt, said, now we're finally making some progress. So let's dig a little bit into these fallacies that everybody falls prey to. We see it all the time. The way I got onto this was as a DPE and as a you know pilot for hire, I spend a lot of time at airports and usually either before in the middle or after one of these events, I'll be out watching takeoffs and landings. And I'm sure every one of you has done the same thing. And you watch and they're coming down final and they're high and they're low and they're left and they're right. And then the inevitable, you know, in the ground effect in a series of overcorrections, and then finally, bang, we're on the runway. And I call them crashing those sometimes, but you watch the next one and it's totally different. There's a whole different series of errors happening and, you know, the same result, not a very good landing. And think about what's going on inside that cockpit because we've all as CFIs been there. There's terror on the part of the student. They've got a grip on the yoke. Their eyes are glazed over. They're full of fear. They're not learning. And there's absolutely no reason they should be there. So where I usually start this talk is with the final form, because that's what's going on here. Some educator has gotten a learner into the pattern, and they obviously have no command of the basics. So that's called teaching in final form. And we're going to go through these in detail. I'm just going to run through the highlights now, and then we'll we'll dig into the into the details. 
if you watch someone else landing and perhaps they're a single pilot in the plane. And so you assume this is somebody that's out practicing their landings and you might see the same results. And the thought that if you do more and more and more of these, you're gonna get better and better is uh, practice makes perfect. And I think we all know by now that that's, that's an overstatement. Practice makes permanent. And in some cases, it actually burns in some pretty bad habits. So that's another error that a lot of flight trainers run into. The skill training being in, intrinsically enjoyable is something I was talking to Ken Whittakin, if you were in the last uh, webinar. And, uh, you know, we all know that flying's fun, it's rewarding, it's intrinsically motivating, but you have to think back to when you were a learner or when you were in training. Was that fun? You know, that really is filled with quite a bit of psychological struggle, quite a bit of fear. There's a plateau, there's a lot of self doubt. So, you know, skill training at the higher level is not really intrinsically enjoyable. That's a big mistake. And we tend to think that just because people are in a plane, they're having a good time. But if you experienced what your learner was experiencing, you probably would understand that that's a pretty big fallacy. Seeking early perfection is something that really is a big problem in aviation, just because aviators in our our particular field, a lot of us are tend toward perfectionism. It's kind of a problem. It's a big problem when an aviator becomes an instructor and they insist on a level of performance, especially initially, that tends toward perfection. So we really have to tone that down. And what I usually recommend, and this is from a mentor of mine, is in the pre-solo phase, you want to have about half the standard that you would look for in the final form. The idea is to get all of the darts on the dartboard first. They can't, none of them can miss. You know, you have to get pretty good performance in all the areas, and then you move them toward the center. And we will talk a little more about that also. As we go down through this list, this, this one here, initial performance as a good predictor of final, final success. Boy, I see that all the time. I used to uh, do flight exams for a school that's near us. And uh, I'd read their log books, you know, oh, you started flying here. What motivated you? You know, you're trying to relax the applicant when you're doing a flight test. And I'd look in the, like the second entry in the logbook was, you know, spins or something, you know, pretty similar to that falling leaf. And I'm like, wow, how was that for you? And they usually say terrifying, you know, it's like, why would someone do that? But this particular instructor thought that that was the way you see if somebody was qualified to be a pilot, you put them through this kind of stress training to see if they survive it. So that was his way of determining, you know, if someone could move forward. But what I discovered running a flight school was there really is no way you can tell, at least unless it's a gross problem from initial performance, if someone is going to succeed in flight training. So that's a pretty big error. The last one was pretty much from a friend of mine, a Rich Stoll, knowing and doing. It's the same thing he always says. Doing is very different from the knowing part. And where I got to see that quite a bit was in my school, which is at associated with the university. We get a lot of professors. We get a lot of very smart people. And they always stumble onto this fallacy. They think because they have a very good uh, sort of conceptual grasp of the subject, it's going to really make that the rest of it just a you know a no brainer. And frequently, they are the hardest people to uh, teach for that reason. So I'm going to see. Whoops, that's the wrong thing to do here. I just lost all my navigation come forward to me i think i need two screens to make this work successfully um anyway a lot of these came from the civilian pilot training programs world war ii we were desperately trying to make pilots and it was sort of 
almost an industrial manufacturing, if you will, of pilots for the war effort. And whether you know it or not, some of those bomber pilots heading over Germany had 125 hours. I mean, they were very low experienced people because that's all we had. And it was a desperate way of making pilots. They had to pretty much solo in nine, 10 hours, or we weren't going to succeed. So that sort of became the standard, and that persists today. And a lot of these fallacies that we suffer with also came from that time. I was trained by an old World War II guy, John Stickle, and you know it was absolutely that way. I mean, it was, and I'm sure a lot of you people know the World War II sort of mentality. But we've discovered an awful lot in psychology, and uh, we really should apply these for more successful and effective education. So hopefully this guy's going to play. We'll see. But here's an example of what I see when I go by an airport and uh, uh, watch some landings. This is just your standard aircraft coming down and you know, I think all pilots love to watch these YouTubes of, you know, <laughs> landings. And in this case, the, the guy comes down, you know, and it's one of those three points and it, it doing that oscillation. And if you ever owned a Cessna or a fleet of Cessnas like we flew, you know how delicate that nose wheel is. And this thing just hippity hops down the runway. And we see that so much. It's, it's just terrifying for both the instructor and the student. And I really, you know, in further versions of this webinar, once I master Zoom, hopefully, uh, we'll talk more about that. But there's ways of soloing a person in, in, the, in the area of about 30 to 40 landings. You don't have to go through 100 landings and torture the machinery and the student and the uh, <laughs> instructor. So, but this is one of the quotes from the, the paper that I cited. What makes us think that these fallacies would be successful in training is because they work with simple skills. Practice makes perfect. The idea that you can show something in final form, if it's a simple kind of a uh, operation that works, but when you try to extend it to a high performance skill, all of these don't work at all. They're very inefficient and counterproductive, especially in terms of your learner. And they try to complete things, you know, with just minor instructions and you think they're going to land. So jumping into, uh, we'll just move back. I have to manually advance these, but this is the actual paper. And this is the only version of it that I could find. It was the Human Attention Research Laboratory in the, uh, in Illinois, and the guys, like I said, uh, I don't see his name on this one, Walter Schneider, is uh, still alive. He's a very respected cognitive neurologist at uh, University of Pittsburgh now. But this had a lot of the details that we're talking about. The other. So jumping into the very first one here, um, and anyone have any questions since we're at a sort of a breaking point, and then we'll run through this. If you have any questions, throw them into the chat quick, and I'll try to quick answer them. I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the landings. You may not think about the implications of that in terms of the equipment and terrifying the students. So this is not just in landing. Where I see this a lot also as a DPE, and it's not visible to you, but the same exact thing happens IFR when a when an instructor trains a student um, and they start with the approaches or they they really give short shrift to the basic attitude instrument flying. In other words, the most complex thing in the instrument environment is the approach. Excuse me. And the very same thing happens when I see an applicant for an instrument rating. And instead of, you know, being trimmed and all set and power settings, I mean, it's what I call the washing machine, the yokes up and down, left and right, the powers up and down. In other words, a person is trying to fly a very complex maneuver and they don't have mastery of the basics. When I evaluate a CFI that's getting their instrument and I ask them, what do you do to teach basic attitude instrument flying? There's just a blank. 
it seems like in the modern training environment, people begin with the approaches. We used to do pattern A, pattern B, or something called a vertical S. If anyone in the audience knows what a vertical S is, put a note in the chat. <laughs> I desperately trying to find that anywhere online. The only place I found it was in Glime. But there's a lot of very good maneuvers to teach the basic attitude instrument flying before you get to the final form. The final form trying to teach that is it's hopeless because there's so many elements that have to be mastered. And we're going to talk in April 7th, the next one of these two weeks hence, about what we call incremental mastery. Incremental mastery is building step by step and turning it over to the learner. So we'll go through that. But in both cases, either in the landings or in the instrument approaches, it's if you watch carefully as a CFI, you will see where the problems are. And your job is to then deconstruct that and work separately on each one of those components to reach a level of mastery before you go back and try to attempt the complex skill. Sometimes as a CFI, when you're doing a flight review, you'll get a you'll get a person who's already an experienced pilot and i had one of these the guy actually owned his own aircraft as soon as i got in there with him it was very apparent that he didn't know how to land the plane he never had gotten the full benefit of mastery in the landings and it really only took 3 hours and he said boy i'm you know it was it was just a master stroke he was so happy once he realized and it really was a perceptual problem that he was having but as a as a savvy cfi you have to be able to take people like that and you look at what's going on and they say i am having a problem with the landings and that's not really the problem that's not what you have to fix. The problem somewhere else. And you as a CFI have to put on your evaluator hat, very carefully look at it, take it apart, fix the broken component, and then reassemble it into the successful total skill. So it's quite a different kind of thing from teaching an initial learner, but it's the same process. When I used to teach primary, every lesson on the flight plan that I had for the student, my first thing at the top, and the FAA doesn't have this on their form, the first thing on the top was prerequisites. And the reason that was there, say you're going to go out with a commercial student, they're learning Shondells, and you take off and you make that left climbing turn. And hopefully you know that as you're making a steady state left climbing turn, you have to add right rudder to keep it coordinated. And you notice your learner is not doing that. How successful do you think we're going to be flying Shondells or trying to teach a person to fly Shondells? So they don't have the prerequisite skill to start to learn Shondells. You have to back up to a more basic place and teach them coordinated climbing turns and then get into the more complex element, which would be the Shondell. So as a CFI, this is critical at every point in your job. Practice makes perfect. Yeah. So this is a this is a big one. And as I said, you know, that's an element of what you see in the final form problem which is somebody is out there just beating the snot out of a plane and they're not getting any better at it over and over and over is really not going to fix the problem. That should be pretty obvious. The addition of a knowledgeable, savvy CFI is usually the best solution there. But some people are reluctant to pay for that. We'll talk in a future lesson about something called reflective analysis. There are ways to improve your own performance as a individual in the plane without dual, but it's pretty rare and it's a pretty complex task. But for the most part, um, just practicing over and over doesn't really solve the problem. This is the human performance curve. And this was developed way back in the early 1900s by Eric East Dodson. And it's it should be obvious once you understand what's going on here. On the left side is bored, unmotivated. Um, it's what I call the uh, human screensaver. It's, you know, when you're just vegging, you're in a, what we call uh, code white, fat, dumb, and happy. It's not a place where you're motivated or curious and 
to be in a learning state, you have to get more energized, you have to be motivated, and that's where you see the optimal performance. That's the area that would be the learning zone. And so if somebody isn't fully there, sometimes the lesson might be best canceled. Or there's, you know, you talk through it and you say, okay, we got to charge up. I just did this seminar yesterday at Syracuse for dynamic risk management. And my point to those people in that audience with this curve was, as a pilot, when you're going to take off, you have to move yourself physically to an area where you're charged up and motivated and alert and vigilant. But where we have to teach is just a little bit beyond that. Daniel Coyle was the one who really focused in on this place, and it's called the struggle zone. The struggle zone is just a little out of the comfort zone where you're working hard, you're not achieving success, you're not to the point of flailing, but you're just struggling. And that is the magic place to teach. It's called optimal challenge or it's in, in Daniel Coyle's words called the talent code. So this book, if you haven't seen it as a CFI is golden. It's not in the aviation ecosystem. You won't find it at Sporties or ASA. It's a New York Times bestseller and it's a very easy read. And I think this guy has a real interest in aviation because he puts quite a lot of emphasis on simulators and talks quite a bit about uh, Link and the original simulator and airmail pilots. So it's kind of a fascinating read for pilots. But the point of the book is that he went to all these really successful schools, and we're talking tennis, soccer, stringed instruments. And what he discovered was a very small number of these were achieving the greatest success of like a tennis club outside Moscow, you know, a little dingy building, but they would turn out all the best tennis stars, upstate New York, a string academy that, you know, had all the famous performers came through. And the, the secret of all of them was the fact that they trained in what he calls the struggle zone. And what this does neurologically is it myelinates those nerves so that it's sort of like what he called a broadband for the brain. In other words, rewire your brain. So uh, if as an educator, you can do this with a learner, you're going to achieve amazing success. So I'd really encourage everyone to look at that. Now, when I do a lesson, what I'm always thinking is I'm evaluating that learner and I'm saying, where are they? What are their skill sets? And then how can I very carefully move them just a little out of the comfort zone so they're just challenged enough that they're struggling but not overwhelmed? So try playing with that. Get that book and I really think you'll see something exciting. Can we uh, um, just pause for one question in there? Absolutely. Think, um, yeah. That Samara has. Going. <laughs> Samara says, at what point does the struggle zone become the frustration zone? No matter what the student, where, the, where no matter what the student does, they just can't pass a specific hurdle. I found that I can come back to this topic area, but not allow too much time to pass before I get back to it. But it's important to be aware of when the student is reaching that level. Sometimes the answer is to just end the session and do something far simpler on the way back to the field. Any comments yeah, on that? I, th I think you've got the real answer, which is you can't just keep beating your head against it. Um, to the, you know, and sometimes what you can do is simplify it. In other words, if what you're struggling with is a complex task, can you break it into smaller pieces? Ideally, then you could master those pieces and they get a sense of success. And then you move into that challenge again. It does become a psychological plateau, though, eventually, you know, and they go, oh, not that again. So you really do have to vary the practice. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a future lesson, too. But varying the practice, they call it interleaving, is also a very successful instructional strategy, which is you don't push too hard, too long on one thing. You back up and give them something else. The idea of, of pushing and pushing and pushing on something is kind of this idea here. Some people really push too hard and they try to get a level of perfection in everything. That is very demotivational for a, an early learner.
So it's it's kind of that same thing. Once once they're in the struggle zone, you it you know it's and it's almost like a rheostat. You know, you turn up the heat a little and then you back it off a little. The challenge, it's 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 really the art of instruction is how to get that optimal challenge so that they can achieve mastery and not become demotivated and you know keep failing. So you have yeah, to one. Juan says, I find when teaching steep turns, it is best to break it down. Don't go into a 45 degree turn. Start at 20 and 30 degrees first. The learner has a better view at the site picture as he or she progresses to 45 degree bank. It's not Juan Ramos, is it? Does it yes, have it life? is. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, Juan in uh, Long Island. How are you, sir? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good place. Um, you know, and it's funny that it, it, it's... Um, we're all guilty as flight instructors, you know, we tell people to let's do a turn, you know, and 30 degrees to them is just, you know, it's overwhelming and they've terrified. One of my good friends, John Dorsey up in Wisconsin had a good idea. He says, let your learner pick the angle of bank that's comfortable for them. Let them determine what their level is. And then, you know, you move it a little further each time. So yes, I agree with you, Juan. You don't want to go right into 45 degrees and just say, you got to do this. So when I hear that from an instructor, I know I, I'm talking to an experienced person because fear, uh, at one point I want to make through this whole, whole series of seminars is that fear absolutely poisons learning. Once you scare somebody, boy, they their brain shuts down. So rolling into 45 degrees of bank initially probably is going to be a bad idea. But there are these kind of, uh, and Rod Machado has a picture of this drill sergeant as a CFI. Some CFIs are like that. They insist on, you know, bang, that's what we're going to do and we're going to achieve perfection. It's certainly why we have a huge dropout rate in aviation. Again, to back up to what we were initially saying, you have to have a relationship of trust you have to have empathy for your learner. You have to kind of think back to when you were there and doing that stuff. And it's like, I remember very uh, vividly being in a Piper with my dad in the back seat on my very first lesson and looking out of the window at the ground going, <laughs> I don't know if I can do this. It's a real long ways down there. I was terrified. Um, but fortunately I had an instructor who was very good, you know, and took it slowly. What I see in a lot of academies now are these um, CFIs who are just going by the syllabus and less than three says slow flight stalls. And this is the power off. And now we're going to do the power on. And the person might only have three hours in the plane. They're terrified. They're not learning. They're going to probably quit. And, you know, uh, it, it depends how desperately they want that job at the airlines now. But uh a lot of people just shut down and they don't learn. So anyway, this push for perfectionism is very common in pilots because there is in the piloting world itself a real push toward perfectionism. And I want to be very clear about this. We want high goals. We want to pursue excellence. But we should be aware that perfectionism is, you know, that's a psychological problem that's in the DMS for psychologists to fix. Perfectionism is self-assailing. It makes you feel inadequate. So we're striving for perfection with the awareness that it's an elusive goal that we probably won't achieve. So we're, we're moving toward excellence is a better way to think about it. Uh, let's see what slide we're on. So yeah, I did write a whole blog on that. And I should put in the chat, but I don't have it here tonight. Um, there is a very interesting quiz for pilots and it's a personality test. And I initially said, oh, that's not me. And then I started reading it going, yep, 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 that's me. Um, something you can do with your significant other on a, on a, you know, a night where you're not too busy and you'll have a great time with it. And they'll probably say, yeah, that's you. Um, but we do strive for perfectionism and that is a big problem, both as a CFI and as a pilot. Okay, so we talked a little about this one already, the school where they were doing spins on lesson two to see if people were had the stuff. That's really the old uh, civilian pilot training. They would just wash people out if they didn't qualify. 
But I'll share one other story about that. I had a good friend who was also a DPE. And, you know, there's a little talk behind a curtain sometimes about how you evaluate people. But this guy actually said to me, he said, it was a non-towered field. He says, I listen to the radio call as they come in. I watch the landing as they come touch down. And he says, I already know if they're going to pass the test or not. And I'm like, oh, my God, that is such a bad attitude. Uh, a lot of times these are what we call self-fulfilling prophecies. We, we you know, by our attitude, determine whether someone's going to be successful or not. You have to be very careful as an educator. And here again, the compassion part comes into play. So anything else in the chat there? behind the scenes just a few um tidbits from some folks i'll um share aloud what arthur um said a while back perfect example of practice not making perfect is pre-check ride students practicing landings solo brian says practice makes permanent and not always a good permanent <laughs> philip says i find that i take on different personalities with different students some students tend to push you as an instructor more than others um, Brian also shared perfection is the enemy of progress sometimes. Thanks. All. Yeah, well, I would, you know, I would really emphasize that in the pre-solo phase, perfection or as an instructor, certainly striving for perfection will ruin a student. But you get some students that are so driven that they almost ruin their own uh, efforts. You know, they're demanding so much of themselves. We should also talk about why people get into that early landings. It's often driven by the learner because every pilot who's learning to fly knows that they have to master that landing. And so they want to get to it as soon as possible to get more practice for one and for two to see if they can do it so they don't waste money. You really have to hold them back and make sure that they have command of all the basics before you get into serious landing practice. And I can't emphasize that enough. You withhold it as a goal once they've achieved, you know, good slow flight, ground tracking, all the other things. And we'll talk about that. April 7th is going to be incremental mastery. And we'll talk about all the steps. But just think of 6187 and all the elements that are in there. You basically are teaching somebody to fly entirely before they learn to land. All those elements are in there. So um, it's a pretty big challenge. There's a joke among flight instructors that all we really do is teach people to land because all of the elements of flying besides navigation are, are right in there. And now that navigation seems to be following the pink line, I, <laughs> I don't know how far um, we can go with that. Any anyway, initial performance self-fulfilling prophecies? Yeah, I've only had about uh, in the 16,000 hours of dual, but I've only had, I think, three people that I absolutely had to say, you know, this is not for you, take up bowling. Um, and it was, it was really, one was an attitude problem. One was a very high performing guy, but he was um, kind of autistic level. And if he didn't have an exact script perfectly every time, he would just fall apart. We all know that flexibility and resilience are key skills that a pilot has to have. You know, if something goes different, you have to be able to handle it. And that person wasn't going to be able to. But it's very, very few people, I think, personally, still, that just about everybody can learn to fly at a safe level. They have to just control the challenge. You know, they don't want to ask themselves to do too much. So if they have a good sense of themselves and their own limitation, I think most everyone can fly. This is the intrinsically enjoyable part. Um, I think we don't realize, you know, and back to Juan's point about the steep turns, you know, I, I think you really have to understand how scared some people are. They are suffering over there in a lot of times, and they're also struggling with the achievement thing. So take it slow, take it carefully, make sure you get feedback from your people uh, as you're instructing. Let's see how we're going on time. This is the basis. This will be April 7th, Incremental Mastery. And um, part of how I developed this, and I don't think it's anything that people haven't seen or thought about, it's just putting a name on it. But what I do is I just, as each element is mastered by the student, I turn it over to them and I say, okay, you're in charge of assuring the plan legal. 
We've got all the inspections done. You can do the check of the weather and brief me on it. I don't want to be telling you if we're going to go flying. As a DPE, I see people who are getting ready for their flight test, and they're still not in charge of the plane. Um, and they've already soloed, and they've flown, and I'm like, it's terrifying. They never will be in charge if the CFI does not give them the controls, basically. So we as CFIs have to learn that we're turning over the responsibility step by step. And ultimately, we have to get out of the plane. We have to become superfluous. So, you know, there again, that's an ego thing for the CFI. The ideal student is somebody that flies away on their own, totally in command of that plane without us. It's very much like parenting. You don't want to be the helicopter CFI sort of hovering at every point and checking everything. You want to look carefully and make sure it's all there. But uh, so incremental mastery is that the uh, we'll talk more about exactly what all those things in the half solo is. We got to hold that for April 7th. Anyway, uh, this fallacy is, like I said, this picture, I think, is from Rich Stoll, thinking and doing. I think we had this at our very first CFI Pro in Frederick. But um, a lot of people think because they have mastery in one field or they have very good cognitive ability, that's going to lead to success in the plane. And certainly there is knowledge that's required, and it certainly does help. But, you know, mental is very different from kinesthetic hand and eye coordination. So thinking and doing are very separate things. I'll tell you one funny thing about chair flying, because I, I have all my students do that. I think it's a very successful strategy. But back when we taught in Cessna 150s, if you recall, and some of you may still be suffering along in Cessna 150s, I don't mean to denigrate anyone, but... There was a throttle and there was a uh, a red knob with no protection, you know, that turned the, turned the uh, fuel off called the mixture and then the carburetor heat. Well, this guy, um, you know, he was doing his chair flying and I don't think he did it carefully enough. He, he Every time he forgot the carb heat and he pulled the mixture. So his chair flying was, you know, had a had an error in the script. And boy, did he perfect it. Boy, every time around the pattern, he pulled the mixture. And it's like, so here's an example of practice doesn't make perfect. But it certainly made permanent for him. I was I was scared to leave him in the plane alone after that. But uh, you can, you habits are very, very important that you make them correctly. Um, and you really have to, you know, this is why YouTube is for me such a, scary phenomena for student pilot. You really have to curate what they're watching because they come up with some things and you go, where did you get that? And it's like, oh, there's a guy. What I compare YouTube to uh, online, especially for aviators is, you know, it's like one of those buffets where all the food is laid out. But instead of everything being nourishing, you have to think of every third one is poisonous. So you really have to say, take that one, take that one, don't take that one because um, there's a lot of bad stuff out there, unfortunately. So this is the uh, this is a blog I wrote about the uh, accomplished professor. Um, and it's um, there's actually a pretty good and I don't I should have had that for the chat, too. But there's a um, Chris Argylis. He writes for the Harvard Business Review about teaching smart people how to learn. There's some of the hardest people to really educate well. Um, because in a lot of cases, they're so talented that they've never failed at anything. They've never struggled at anything, for one. And then for two, they have this implied uh, thought that they're going to succeed because they have mastery in another area. So there is a book on that that's uh, useful, I would say. And again, it's not in the aviation ecosystem. It's a, a training book that you don't usually see at Glimer or Sporties or anywhere else. And I'd emphasize that for CFIs, you know, you're educators and there's a lot of good information in other books. These two books here, I can't recommend enough. Um, this guy, Stanislaw Stahane, is, is an amazing educator. That book is golden. The other one, How We Learn, for Benedict Carey, very good. Um, but to go back to Stanislaus, you know, there's a lot of uh, still uh, push for scenarios. And I don't want to denigrate scenarios. They're wonderful. 
But initially, there's not too much that you can do with a learner with a scenario. In other words, when you're trying to teach with scenarios, you're teaching at the correlative level. You're teaching at a very high level. And again, you're almost teaching in final form if you haven't taught the rote understanding application part, teaching just correlation or trying to teach correlation is kind of a very inefficient way to proceed. We all know that when you learn a physical skill like piano, you're going to do scale for hours and hours and hours before you can play Chopin. Uh, and when you fly, there has a certain amount of basic control movement and habits you have to develop before scenarios really make sense. You can offer scenarios in those, like you saw in the incremental learning, okay, what are we going to do if the turn coordinator is broken or this and this, but you have to offer the scenarios only within their bandwidth of mastery. I see a lot of scenarios, people try to do it early on and I call it fantasy flight training because they're just wasting money, they're taking long trips and the learner's not benefiting at all. So Stanislas de Hain really goes into that quite extensively. That kind of learning, which they call discovery exploration, has been totally thrown out um, for early learning. So yeah, I think it's, I can almost tell you it's on page 138 of that book. Very, very good stuff. Another educator, John Hattie from Australia, has done extensive work on that. So save the uh, scenario more and more and more for once they have the skills and they're in command of the aircraft, and then you can give them some challenges like that. So as said, this will be uh, this will be incremental mastery will be April seventh, and we'll talk about. And David, is that um, also going to be wings credit? Say again. Is there going to be wings credit for that April seventh webinar? Uh, yes. We had a question. Okay. Yeah, if, if I don't totally screw this up, <laughs> uh, yes, we're hoping for that. Um, they're very excited about getting more of this online, and I would encourage all of you. You know, uh, I guarantee we'll get this smoother. <laughs> with a little more practice, but uh, I think it's a really good way to spread this information. CFI Pro has been, you know, in the closet for about three, four years as we've been developing it. And now we really want to get it out to everybody. So uh, that will be, uh, so let's see if we've got some good questions. We got about five more minutes, maybe, especially since I dorked around with the first part of this. Questions on what we presented tonight, answers, ideas, Juan Ramos always has good ideas. Um, there is one question in here um, from a, a few minutes ago from Ravi who says, my impression was that a DPE has to follow the ACS in evaluating the applicant, question mark. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, but within that, you know, we can't test outside the standards, but there's a lot of ways in which we can um, frame the question. Uh, or offer the challenge. If it's a good DPE, you know, it's not scripted to the point that it's the same test every time. Um, some of the, you know, and I could go on and on and on about the DPE part of it. Yes, we're absolutely, we are absolutely limited by that test. But if you look at it, you know, you'll see that there's a lot of ways that it can be varied to offer a challenge. Crazy little things happen, you know, and I, I was thinking about this the other day. The one piece of advice I have seen just lately with privates is, you know, and it's it's almost incomprehensible, but pre-flights are pretty terrible with a lot of students, um, I should say learners. And it's because I think we do all of that initially with the pilot. We, we give them a really extensive first two hour initial pre-flight and then we expect them to do it on their own. And we don't revisit it enough and check. You know, It's like go out and pre-flight, I'm getting a cup of coffee, I'll meet you at the plane type thing. And if they never get a higher level analysis of what a pre-flight looks like, or if you don't add meaning to that, they're really unprepared to meet the DPE. I have had applicants at the back of the plane and I say, what's this? Oh, that's the rudder. What's it used for? Uh, turning the plane. Well, really? You know, uh, and that's one way of testing aerodynamics is just to ask a question like that. Well, if they say it overcomes adverse yaw, the aileron goes down, one goes up, I'm going, okay, you know what you're talking about. But I get some very perfunctory rote level answers and sometimes I don't even get answers. 
I get people telling me the fan belt turns the prop, you know, the little belt that runs the alternator. It's like that turns the prop. I'm not going flying. So, you know, uh, the DPE world's not as abstruse as you think. We don't ask tough questions. We ask very simple questions, but we want solid answers. And they are within the standards, but sometimes they're not what the CFI asks so the applicant doesn't know. You have to be creative as a CFI and, and get out of the box a little and not just conform to what the syllabus says. Get get, get creative and ask because <laughs> your DPE is going to. So Samara says, I can identify with the whole thing about frustration. Early in my career before CFI, I quit flying helicopters because I could not get past a specific obstacle. So I'm very interested in the incremental learning discussion in April. And... Um, Philip says, one of the issues is what I call DPE shopping. People learn to shop for easy DPEs because they know what they don't know and their student won't know either. Yeah, you know, that's I, I wrote, there. Yeah, I wrote a blog on the Santa Claus uh, DPEs and, you know, a lot of these schools say we can't find DPEs and what they're meaning is they can't find easy DPEs that will pass all their students. Um, I don't know the answer to that. That's that's unfortunate. The idea of when we talk about incremental mastery, though, one very important component of that that we'll talk about in April is that you know, a CFI has to not only be teaching, but they have to know the time when to be quiet and watch what's happening and, and see what the applicant, what their learner is going to do, because that's what a DPE does, is we don't interfere. We're just taking notes. Uh, and we're looking to see what their performance are. If you're always intervening, you'll never see what they can do on their own. So uh, incremental mastery really, and that optimal challenge also means you have to be able to discern where their level is so that you know if they have it or not, if they're meeting the standard or not, or what kind of a uh, challenge I can offer them. In every case, you want to remember that the ACS is the minimum standard for certification, and it also is not a training manual. We can still teach flight with the stall warner going off minimum controllable airspeed. They can't test it that way, but it's valuable to see how quickly induced drag will um, overcome the plane if you fly slower and slower and slower. I mean, that region of reverse command type thing, uh, slower than the glide speed, has become like a dark, scary area for everybody. No one flies there, and I think that's dangerous. We have to understand that part of flight because that's where we are when we're landing. So as CFIs, we have a pretty big mandate. Um, people look at DPEs and think they're the ones that are influencers. They're not. It's the CFI that really determines safety what they teach, what they don't teach, and how well they teach it is critical. That's why we're doing these webinars, and I, I hope it helps. Anyway.